his maha prasadam from my plate and ate it. No one has ever done such a thing, 68 years old. No one ever takes food from your plate in a public place, somewhere where you're paying money to sit down. <laughs> but he didn't answer that. He answered that she was taking care of us nicely. Yes. So he said women have a natural tendency to serve her. One purport Prabhupada says, it's easier for a woman to become Krishna conscious because they have a natural tendency to serve. Men have a natural tendency to be served. It's more difficult to learn how to become a servant, which is, that's our business, to become a servant. That's what I was, servant. I didn't have a father. He died, I was three. I had my mother and two older sisters. That's all I learned from them was how to serve. I would see it every day of my life. And so I think it helped. It helped me become servant to Prabhupada. Whatever he said, I would jump, I would do it. No questions asked. So that was 1975. So then we just, we had our hot milk, fruit, cheese, like that. We had everything. By this woman went into first class, she comes down, pushes the tray now. And she's serving us all very nicely. So, as 20 years go by, I'm speaking at a Prabhupada festival in Los Angeles, which is just north of Mexico, Tijuana, Mexico. It's like a three-hour ride into Mexico. So I was speaking at a Prabhupada festival, and I spoke just like here. I spoke for an hour or two that day. And afterwards, a godbrother came up to me. And he said, can, can I tell you a story? So I said, okay. <laughs> I'm still sitting down, waiting to get up after sitting cross-legged for two hours. <laughs> but I said, okay. And he started telling me about their preaching work down in Mexico and Brazil, South America. He said, it's, of course, everything. He said, we went outside of the cities, every town and village. This is our business, not just the cities. Every town and village, this Krishna consciousness will be, will be there. This Hare Krishna mantra will be heard every town and village. So that's what they were doing. So they would go to the different towns, Mexico, much like Europe. They would have center squares, sometimes a fountain in there where you would get your spring water at the fountain, all the little shops nearby. And they would do Hari Nam. And then after doing that for an hour or two, they would get in their jeeps, their four-wheel drive vehicles, and they would go out into the countryside. And you'd have to go one house, you might go another kilometer, half a kilometer to get to the next place. And this way they were preaching everywhere, South America. And uh, he said, when he was going out in the vehicle, one day, of course, he went and stopped at this cottage out in the country, and he's knocking on the door. He's got Prabhupada's books, distributing books. So he knocks on the door, and this woman answers, a middle-aged woman, young lady, and she says, Hare Krishna. He's wearing dhoti, kurta, got a shaved head, kiba. She says, Hare Krishna, come on in. So he goes in and there's pictures of Prabhupada deities in the room and he's totally bewildered. He said, where did you ever hear of Krishna consciousness? <laughs> she said, well, I first met the devotees, she said, when I was a stewardess. <laughs> <laughs> she was the woman who had taken the prasadam, Prabhupada's maha maha prasadam, from my plate. And she, then she met devotees later on, uh, preaching, going out, preaching in the cities, going here and there. So she ran into devotees. And she became devotee. She became initiated devotee. And after 20 years, he finds her. This is what we say. This is no accidents. There's no accidents. Everything. Krishna is making all arrangements. Just two years ago, she was in Vrindavan, Krishna Balaram Mandir. She was telling others the story. It's actually an unbelievable story unless you know it's true, but it's exactly what happened. So just by taking Prabhupada's prasad, imagine, just by taking remnants from his plate, and why did she do it? Because Krishna's in the heart. Huh? So Prabhupada said, we go out on kirtan. He said, our business is always, whatever we do, 
only one we're trying to attract is Krishna. We're not trying to attract an audience. We're not trying to attract a crowd. We're not doing a performance. Whatever we do, our service is to please Krishna, to attract Krishna. Because he said Krishna is in everyone's heart. And if their sincerity is there, automatically they'll come, they'll be attracted. Huh? Yeah. Ari Das Thakur, everywhere he travels, been through South Africa here. He went from he went from Durban to Cape Cod in a car. Wow. From East London. <laughs> East Durban, East London, nice now. Yes. Cape Town. Cape Town. Beaufort West. Bloemfontein. Johannesburg. Yeah. Kruger yeah. National Park. <laughs> through there and he has books and mantra cards everyone he sees he just gets them to chant Hare Krishna and of course no one has ever heard of Hare Krishna wherever he goes he's wondering why after 40 years no one has heard of Hare Krishna so you have so much work to do very nice to come here jump up and down dance for Srila Prabhupada dance for the deities but our business is preaching and this is Prabhupada's movement. It's a preaching movement. Somehow or other, he wants us to be engaged in helping spread this Krishna consciousness. So that was on the way to Caracas. Now we get to Caracas. Prabhupada stayed there for several days. And he gets there and who's on the altar? Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda. He goes, well first he sits on the Vyasasana. Now, I was with Prabhupada two times. First time, 16 months. Second time, a year. A little over a year. So between those two times, I was away for eight months. Six of those months, I was in the temple in Caracas, Venezuela. So now we're back to Caracas, Venezuela. So I knew there was 20 devotees or so in the temple. I knew them all personally. I knew them by name. They knew that I was Prabhupada's servant. Now I was a married man with my wife. We went there. So when we got back, I was very happy that they could see me as Prabhupada's servant. Proud to be Prabhupada's servant. So Prabhupada sits on the Vyasasan, and instead of doing my duties, there was a number of things. Prabhupada would sit down, you'd take his cane from him. If he was going to give class, he'd give him his glasses. And this, we came from Mexico City, so he had socks on his feet. So now we're in Caracas, it was warmer. But I, after he sat down, I was looking at my god brothers and kind of... Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so all of a sudden, something hit me in the head. And Prabhupada took his socks off. He rolled them into a ball and threw them at me. <laughs> just to wake me up. Let me know again. He would tell me again and again, you're just a servant. You're just a nobody. And you think you're somebody because you're my personal servant. But you're just a servant. And I have thousands of them. And they're all the same. GPC, Temple Presidents. Once in New York, no, sorry, New York, Los Angeles, he walked into the kitchen, the world headquarters. 1973, 1974, beautiful, everything stainless steel, spotless, first class worship, Rukmini, Dwarkadish deities. They would bring people from all over to see how to worship properly. But he went into the kitchen one day, and he went to the sink, big, big stainless steel sinks and all, and there were dirty pots in the sink. So he's with the temple president and the GBC, and he sees the pots in the sink. And he said, why are these pots dirty? He said, Krishna's kitchen. And the temple president, GBC, there. And they said, well, someone will be coming soon. There isn't anyone to do them right now. And he looked at them. He said, what are you doing? He said, you do them. He didn't see. He didn't see all these different gradations, huh? Big devotee, not so big devotee, little devotee, all the same. They were all his servants. Anyone should be ready to do anything at any time. Then while he was in there walking around, there was a big colander. He had strawberries. So this was 1973. Huh? Big, beautiful 
California was one of the bread baskets and lots of oranges, fruits, now almonds everywhere. They just grow almond trees all over. But you could get very nice fruits at that time, citrus fruits. So these strawberries were very red, juicy, and they were just sitting in the colander. So Prabhupada, of course, he knew what they were, but he, and there's the brahmacharinis in the kitchen. Huh? At that time, we had many brahmacharinis. <laughs> so they're there, and Prabhupada looks in the colander, he said, what are these? And they said, oh, they're strawberries, Prabhupada. He said, oh, he picked one up, and he starts to put it to his mouth. And they said, oh, Prabhupada, it's boga. He said, oh. <laughs> and he threw it in his mouth. Very often I would have people would ask me, because I cook for Prabhupada every day. And his cooker, how he showed me his cooker, rice, dal, make chapatis, four or five, six chapatis, four or five sabjis, all in that cooker. Not the chapatis, that was next to the cooker. And they would say, when you cook for Prabhupada, did you offer it? I'd say, yes. I'd say, I would cook it, put it on the plate, bring it into his room, <laughs> and offer it to him, put it down on the table. he said, well, don't you say prayers? And I'd say, he was right there. What prayers am I going to say? <laughs> no one ever told me what to do, what not to do, including Prabhupada. I just cooked and I would bring it to him. But I found out later on, when he was in India on the train. This is 1970, 71, before I was with him. So, in, uh, of course, anything cooked in ghee huh, becomes purified. And when you pay for it, it also becomes edible huh, by your paying for it. So, um, they're on the train. Train's always stopping in India. You know, they're going from Vrindavan to Mathura, you know, Mathura, Vrindavan, here, there, on the way to Delhi. I don't know where they were going. But. So the train stopped. Prabhupada said, go buy kachuris, cooked in ghee. So the devotee went out and buys kachuris, some kachuris. He comes back, he's got the bag. So then he washes the table, cleans the table, water and cloth, you know, in the train. And he puts the kachoris down, and takes them out of the bag, puts them down. And then he starts to go down onto the floor to offer obeisances. Prabhupada says, what are you doing? He says, I'm offering the kachoris. He said, I'm right here. <laughs> Who are you going to offer it to? We offered a Prabhupada. But this was wonderful it was to have Prabhupada with us. Like I say, I was personal servant, meant pajari. You're a pujari. I did the same things. I cooked for my deity. I would bathe him in the morning, massage him, I'd get him ready for bath, cook for him, lay out his clothes. But he was moving around all the time, so it was a different kind of deity. You couldn't stay still. <laughs> and Vrindavan devotee said, Prabhupada, I just want to sit at your lotus feet. He said, that'll be very difficult. I'm always moving. <laughs> My first days with Prabhupada in Vrindavan, another devotee's brahmachari. And Prabhupada he said, I have difficulty controlling my mind when I chant japa. He said, how do I control my mind? Prabhupada said, there's no question of mind. He said, but it's Prabhupada demands. He said, you chant with your tongue and you hear with your ears. So he just bypassed the whole in between. That is it, that simple. I say it was the shortest Joppa retreat ever. <laughs> One sentence Joppa retreat. No question of mine. Another one said to him, Prabhupada, they say that Mahatma Gandhi, before he died, his last words were wrong. He said, is, is, is that true? Prabhupada said, I don't know, I wasn't there. <laughs> So in Caracas, Prabhupada's on the Vyasa sign, and of course he sees Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda on the altar. And he's looking, and he said, they traveled very far to be here with you. Imagine Prabhupada's, the way he saw things. Prabhupada had traveled very far to be there with you, to be there with them. But he said, Lord Chaitanya, 
said how merciful they are. Had tears in his eyes. One evening we were in his room. He was giving darshan. When he traveled to these places, he would give so much association. He knew how valuable it was every moment you could be with him. So there was a dozen of us in his room one night. In Caracas, Venezuela, summertime, humid, so mosquitoes. It was a mosquito. You say, mosquito cut my forehead. It was cut. And he told that joke. He said, cut a joke. He used the word cut, very funny. He said, you cut one joke, he said. <laughs> he said, mosquito cut his forehead. So now we're there in Caracas, and the devotees being, we always like the glorified Prabhupada. Huh? So one devotee's noticing mosquitoes are bothering him, but they're not bothering Prabhupada. So he said, Prabhupada, these mosquitoes, they have such respect, they don't want to bother a pure devotee. Prabhupada laughed. He said, yes. He said, here they have respect. In Vrindavan, they have no such <laughs> So then we went from Caracas. Next stop was Miami. Prabhupada would call it Miami. Miami. And the same thing. In Miami Temple, he sees Gornatai on the altar. And he starts speaking. How merciful Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda are. He said, they're so merciful, they're just distributing freely Krishna consciousness. He said, and in the future, he said, you may have Radha Krishna deities here. He said, if you're qualified. He said, but you have Radha Krishna, you must be very careful not to make offenses. He said, Lord Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda, they don't accept offense. He said, accidental offenses. But Radha Krishna, you can't make any offense to them. He said, so even you don't get Radha Krishna, he said, Radha Krishna is here, Lord Chaitanya. He said, so you go on worshiping in that way. Then he went to Atlanta for three days. Very amazing three days they were. And the uh, second day was his Guru Maharaj's appearance day. Anyway, he gets to Atlanta and he gave shortest lecture ever. In Atlanta, those deities are still there. Gornatai deities, beautiful Gornatai deities, big, tall, white, huh? Gornatai, no? Oh, um, brass. Brass. Bell metal, whatever. So beautiful they are. Lord Nityananda's, I've been there many times doing Abhi Sheikh Siva. Just being on the altar there, you feel. But Prabhupada saw them that day. He started his lecture, he was already choked up. And he said, Parama Karuna, Pahudvijana. He said, the two lords. He said, they're so merciful. He said, they're distributing love of Godhead freely. He said, to everyone. He said, qualified, unqualified. He's choked up. He said, Krishna is also merciful. He said, but he requires you surrender. He said, but these two two lords, he said, they don't even require surrender. And the more he spoke, he just stopped. And tears came out of his eyes, he closed his eyes, he went into ecstasy. So everyone just sat there. Then finally after 30 seconds, an hour, you don't know, because everyone's just sitting quietly. You don't hear any beads. You don't hear breathing, coughing, nothing. Everyone's just watching Prabhupada. And everyone becomes ecstatic just by his ecstasy. Then finally he would open his eyes, chant Hare Krishna. Mm -hmm. Then the next day was his Guru Maharaj's appearance day. So we went into the temple room, just like here. And in the Vyasa sign, they had a big painting of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati backward, and there a little chair, another seat for Prabhupada. So he came into the temple room, and thought he would sit down, he said, I'll do Arati. So that also was ecstatic, seeing Prabhupada perform Arati, seeing Prabhupada do anything. The day he arrived, he was playing the Murdanga. He said, do you know Parama Karuna? That was the first time he chanted in the temple room, Parama Karuna. Of course, everyone said yes. No one knew anything. <laughs> and then he started playing and no one understood the beat. Instead of one, it was... So 
So no one, so then he said, you practice, we'll come back tomorrow and do. So now this day he's doing the arti to his Guru Maharaj. And he offers the, and the room's like this, it's packed with devotees. Devotees are looking in the windows, looking in the doorway, the windows on this side. And he offers the incense, and he offers the ghee wicks. Then they have the um, conch shell. So he offers the conch shell. And he's standing on that side. On the other side is a Tulsi plant on a stand. So he offers the water in the conch shell. And then he looks down for the lota to pour the water in. But there's no lota. So he looks and he looks at the GBC and he goes, bowl. And the GBC goes, honey, bowl. Bowl, honey, bowl. Honey, bowl. He goes, honey, bowl. And then Prabhupada just looks and he sees the Tulsi plant and he flicks, he flicks the conch shell with the water in it and it's right in the Tulsi plant. All the water lands in the Tulsi plant. And then at the end of the RT, he blew the conch shell, which was a conch shell you couldn't blow because 1975, the good conch shell was on the altar for the deities. So that was the reject conch shell. <laughs> and they never thought Prabhupada would be doing the RT. But of course, he grabbed the conch shell and without any effort, he blew, blew properly. My god brother said, he was watching Prabhupada because he needed to be convinced that he was genuine, as a genuine guru before he would surrender to him. He said, when I saw him blow the conch shell, he said, I could understand. He was, he said, the real deal. He could understand that Prabhupada was special. So then Radha Kund, he became Radha Kund. He left many years ago in Vrindavan. So that was the visit in um, Atlanta. And Prabhupada got there, the first thing he said before the class was, he said, so, he said, we've been to Los Angeles, he said, Mexico City, he said, Caracas, and then he looked at me, I said, Miami, he said, yes, Miami. <laughs> he said, and now we're here in Atlanta. He said, and your temple is the best. Very good. Because it looked very nice. It was about this size, temple, a little longer but just like this. So he was very happy to see nice temple, nice deity worship. When he saw these things going on, he became happy. So this is our business, just to please Srila Prabhupada, somehow or other, doing deity worship, whatever we're doing. But always we should think in terms of whatever we're doing, it has to help the preaching mission, the Prabhupada's mission. Then you get all of Prabhupada's blessings. I could go on the rest of the trip, but it's already um, 12.30. I have to go back to Santum Temple for class there in, in a couple hours. So um, are there any questions, comments? Hare Krishna. Sir, I think one of your conclu one of your initial points and even now your concluding points is that we are a missionary society. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's a... I notice now it's a bit of a challenge for for most of the temples to, to actually do active preaching work. And we obviously want to always encourage that. So what, what, what advice can you give to enthuse the devotees about the importance of having a missionary spirit? I was hoping I just did that. Hari Das Thakur, he can give good advice on. You, see, this is, we're Prabhupada's disciples. We've gone through our whole, our Grahasta Ashram, many of us, we've had businesses, we've done things. Now in Temple President in Hawaii, is my god sister, she's Prabhupada's disciple. We have an Alachua Lady Temple President. We have in D.C. Lady Temple President, Prabhupada Disciple, they just made Lady Temple President in um, Bhaktivedanta Manor. The biggest community outside of India, any temple, thousands of devotees are there. Mostly Indian. <laughs> Preaching is required, all of you. What would Prabhupada, when we were in India, Prabhupada would always say, it's your business. Bharat Barshi, you you're should be the preachers. But who's doing the preaching? Prabhupada's disciples. Now he gave us that. 
we're trying to pass it on to you. I'm 68 years old. What am I going to do you know, for a couple of years or something? But I see there's nothing else to do with my life except try to please Srila Prabhupada. We're trying to instill that missionary spirit in everyone. So you have a vast, biggest, biggest continent in the world here in, in Africa, just in South Africa. Haridas says everywhere he goes, they've never heard of Krishna. So you have a vast place you can go, but you have to leave this building to do it. You're not, you're not going to do anything in here other than chant Hare Krishna and help yourself. But you help yourself more by giving. You don't give Krishna to others. You're never going to experience what we've experienced, what we experience now. The ecstasy of giving Krishna. You, 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 to experience it, you have to make some effort. Uh, Mother Visa once asked Prabhupada, um, how can we please you the most? So that was asked a couple times. Huh? In Atlanta was asked, Prabhupada said, to a big book distributor, he asked Prabhupada, how to please you the most? Because we knew distributing books. But Prabhupada's answer was very simple. He said, you develop your love of Krishna. But that goes hand in hand. How are you going to develop your love of Krishna without making effort? So when Mother Visa asked him, how can we please you the most? He said, you struggle for Krishna. So we have to struggle. That's what I said, we're traveling. It's a struggle. It has wonderful benefits. I get to associate with so many devotees. I become inspired. But I'm inspired by trying to inspire others. You know? I feel Prabhupada's presence by trying to share Prabhupada. If we don't share, what is it called? You become um, uh, miserly. What's miserly? Creepana. Miser. Creepana. Creepana. Huh? Not just for you. As soon as you get it, your duty is to give it to others. Especially all you Indian body people. Huh? Your business. Lord Chaitanya gave you the responsibility to do it. Didn't give it to me. I'm just a Malecha from Philadelphia. <laughs> but you people are all naturally Krishna conscious. So you have to give it to others. So you, you got to struggle. Then you'll feel, you'll feel ecstasy. You'll become happy. Ask anyone that's going out preaching. They'll tell you, that's when I'm happiest. When I'm preaching. That's the only time I'm happy. Oh, happiness is there. Happiness, distress is there. But preaching, no matter what other things are going on, you're happy. Because you're giving Krishna. So you get Krishna. It's just the opposite of the material world, you know. If you have a million dollars and give it to someone else, now you have nothing. But spiritually, you have a million dollars, you give it to someone else, you get two million dollars back from Krishna. Huh? So in that way, this is what we do. This is what we learn from Prabhupada. Didn't tell you the end of that story with Siddha Sarup when he said, well, I guess Prabhupada, I'm not speaking. He said, then why are you speaking? Learn. Learn the philosophy and then speak it. Do something worthwhile. So that's that's our business. It's all very nice. We're chanting our rounds, we're following the principles. But Prabhupada never asked us when people would come in the room, he never said, Did you chant your rounds today? Are you following the principles? That's understood. We've made that vow. We would say, what are you doing? Practical. We would say, just do it. I said, he, long before Nike made that world famous, <laughs> Prabhupada was saying it to everyone, just do it. People would come in, uh, proposals of this and proposals. He'd say, do it. Just do it. He would tell them, go, go for it. Try it. So that's our, that's our business. That's how we please Srila Prabhupada. Okay. Hare Krishna. Sweet little Thank you all very much. Sweet little Prabhupada.